Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Spring Thought Leader Roundtable. Today is the second installment of a three-part series exploring the strategic approaches of the forum for the youth investments work. Karen Pittman, our co-founder, recently transitioned out of organizational leadership to a senior fellow role to find more time. With a national search for our next CEO underway, the forum's mission and vital work continues to help leaders think differently about what it takes to manage and sustain change so that they are more motivated to act differently and ultimately act together as a part of an allied youth serving field. Those who know the forum know that three strategic approaches have guided our work since our founding 20 plus years ago. And those are strengthening practices and programs, improving and aligning policies, and planning and partnering for impact. Over the next month, Karen will sit down with the forum's three program executives to discuss how the forum is changing the odds for young people and explore the future of our work to advance equity, research, policy, and practice across all the systems and settings that shape young people's lives. Two weeks ago, Karen sat down with uh, Kim Robinson, the uh, head of the Weikert Center for Youth Program Quality, and today we'll feature Marita Irby, the forum's co-founder and executive vice president, as well as the managing partner of Big Picture Approach Training and Consulting, the forum's most visible effort devoted to planning and partnering for impact. We will be accepting questions and comments via the chat feature on today's session, which is available at the bottom of your screen. Today's session is being recorded. Next week, it will be sent to everyone who registered and also posted to the forum website, along with any additional resources that are mentioned. So it's now my pleasure to turn it over to Karen. Thank you, Ian. Um, and this is a great opportunity uh, for us, for those of you who are on the call, and I think equally important as we're making these transitions for us to just have this recorded uh, for history. Um, so as Ian said, and Ian, you can go ahead and start to change the slides. Um, as, as Ian said, the forum really has, since its inception, uh, really sort of focused on three broad strategies. Um, these ideas of uh, improving and aligning policies, uh, planning and partnering for impact, uh, and uh, strengthening programs and practices. Uh, and depending on who you are, you may know the forum more for one of those things than the other. Uh, so we thought we would really uh, sort of dig into all of these one at a time uh, and make sure people know uh, what's going on behind them, uh, what the history was and, uh, and where we're going. Uh, so as we zoom into planning and partnering for impact, you can go to the next slide, Ian. Um, it, this is straight from the website. Um, we really have from the beginning been trying to do four things, really sort of sharpen and promote key ideas about youth development, about what youth success looks like, and about how we can really hold leaders to have shared accountability for their progress, really focusing on building the capacity of change-oriented leaders to do this work, starting by thinking differently. And we call them boundary spanners, and that's, that's great. Um, and then um, we really uh, sort of zoom in to say, if you're really boundary spanners and you're trying to do change, what do we know about change management? What do we know about managing change, especially when you're trying to influence change in things that you don't exactly control? Uh, we do this locally and we've done this nationally. We go back and forth in terms of which one we lead with over time. But these really have been the strategies behind the work uh, as we put the forum uh, together. Uh, but what's important to know is that these strategies and their inception really predate the co-founding of the Forum for Youth Investment and go way back um, to when Marita actually uh, joined me at the Center for Youth Development and Policy Research. Uh, and I had had the pleasure of serving with Mildred McLaughlin on uh, the Carnegie Commission on Adolescent Development, uh, where a matter of time came out uh, and was looking for a senior researcher. And Mildred said, without a doubt, you have to talk to Marita. So thinking that Millbury is brilliant, I talked to Marita and Marita joined us um, at the Center for Youth Development in uh, 1994. She may correct me, she usually corrects my dates. Um, but we really had this whirlwind experience of she joined in 94. Uh, several months later, we had an opportunity to go start this President's Crime Prevention Council uh, in the White House. She came along with me uh, to get that started. Um, that didn't last very long. We then took our ideas internationally into the International Youth Foundation, did that for a while, had an opportunity with America's Promise to bring those lessons about how we do policy and practice and partnership work 
brought that back into the US through what was originally called IYF US. Um, and then as that work really grew to the point that we needed a new organization for it, we created the forum. All of that happened in about the span of four and a half years. So as I turned to Marita, I have to turn with first enormous gratitude that she hung in there through the first five years through that many transitions. Second, that she's still with us as the co-founder of the forum. Um, but I wanna just start by saying, Marita, Clearly you didn't sign up to get five jobs in four years when you came to join me at the Center for Youth Development. What was it that attracted you to this work in the beginning? Thank you, Karen. And uh, it's gonna be kind of fun to have this conversation today since I got to interview you a couple of months ago as you were just making this transition. So delighted to be here, delighted to have folks joining us for afternoon tea. Uh, and uh, I've been thinking about this as we, is it a little bit of this kind of trip down memory lane is, um, happening at this time that we have just been through this incredible uh, momentous year where there's been a lot of time for reflection. And there's a lot of time to, to think about how the roots of the work really are all carried forward into the work that we're doing today. So as we kind of zoom back on like what made it, what made it um, attractive in the first place was that the question and, and, and why hang in? Um, I came before I worked with you, there was a time pre-Karen where I was a, an eighth grade teacher. I was a youth worker. I actually had a, um, a organization, a, an after school program called the Culture Club that met in the local library in East Palo Alto, which is also where I taught um, at eighth grade. Uh, I um, was a researcher with, on, the, on the, the work with Milbury and, and Shirley Bryce Heath at Stanford that was on uh, urban sanctuaries. And, and it, it really was starting with the same questions I think that we've been seeing in this, in this past year is the, with, with the urban sanctuaries work, what we were really interested in exploring was we get a sense of just how important schools are in the lives of young people. Families, critically important, and we've been seeing that more than, than uh, it's been more even more visible in this past year, um, but also community organizations, community-based organizations that work with young people. What did those look like? This was, you know, this was 25 plus, 30 years ago um, when we started this work, sorry. and. And it was just like, what really makes them tick? And so I actually got to hang out for five years in, in youth organizations in Chicago and Cabrini Green and Logan Square, Greater Humboldt Park in Fort Worth and um, the Bay Area, um, a little bit in Pittsburgh as well. And we were just trying to figure out both what made them work for young people, but also what needed to be happening in the community around them to help those organizations be strong and what kind of role they played uh, in, in just helping young people navigate the realities that they, they found themselves in. So that, that was my grounding and my, um, my roots in this work, always interested in, in that combination of what happened in, inside of schools, but what was happening in community-based um, organizations and what was, um, and how did that really connect them with families? So coming to work with you, I didn't know it. I don't know if you remember this. It was February 22nd of 1994. Uh, and my first um, day on the job, you said, we have this proposal due to Carnegie by Friday. Can you write it? I didn't know that was actually a proposal to write my, to pay for my job. It turned out <laughs> that it was actually a proposal to pay for this work on school community partnerships that we did with Michelle Cahill. It was really looking at the range of kind of school community partnerships that were kind of in play at that time and why they were central to making this kind of work happen. So that, that was perfect. That was a perfect you know, drop in, in terms of the work. And the other big project, again, I think about this in both this cross system work we do and then also the deep dive of just really understanding community organizations well, is this work that we called the monograph. It was with Chapin Hall. It was, I think 115 um, youth serving organizations across the country that, that you had pulled together all this information and you needed a typology. And you said, bring, tell me how these things all hang together. And I, I remember this much like the proposal for, for um, the school community partnerships work. I remember this as like my second all-nighter when I was working for you where I thought I, could, I have to have this done by tomorrow morning. And I spread out all these organizations on a, and I made this giant matrix and then what brought it into you the next day and laid it out on the giant conference table and said, I think this is how these things hang together. This is what they're about. This is what they do. This is what they have in common. Um, and you said, okay, cool. And we, and we, we, and then we wrote through that. It was the people, places, possibilities. Um, but I will say that that is where I came up with one of the pieces of, of advice that I give to almost all new staff members as they come on board. Sometime in your first two to three months, 
make a matrix for Karen and she will love it. Show us, show us multiple dimensions in the work and then, and then we'll see what we can do with it. Yes. So that, those were the hooks when I first started. Those were absolutely the hooks. And those were the two very ambitious projects that uh, you cut your teeth on um, uh, at the forum. And I'll flag that, you know, I think you were truly, um, in, or at the center, I think you were at the center maybe five months before we made the transition. Okay. So um, it was really pretty quick, but significant work. And I think um, that just as you said, Marita, in some ways we've really come full circle back around to these questions with much more sophistication, with much more understanding of how learning happens with a whole lot more data and a lot more willingness and understanding on the part of schools to think about these partnerships in more strategic ways. But we're right back again at these questions of how do you make these organizations more visible? How really do they hang together as an informal system, as increasingly formal systems that support young people? How are they not just optional, but really a critical part of young people's learning experience? And what is the best way for them to work with schools in this complementary way? So we know we're right back in that. I know that's really what the readiness project's all about, but let's take a little bit of time before we jump all the way up to the current and just go back to that that whirlwind set of experiences that we had together. Um, and I will flag, we had these experiences. Uh, the person who joined us uh, on, this, on this journey um, at the White House uh, was Thaddeus Ferber. Um, and he'll be the next person that we interview <laughs> uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, and he has stayed with us. So there's something about this journey that we started with Rita and then Thaddeus joined the, ca the caravan early on that has really allowed us to stay with these themes and play with them and move them over decades, uh, over decades now. So you had these experiences of going from policy, from practice work to policy work, to partnership building work, all in this short period of time, domestic and international. What, what was the common theme? What was the takeaway that by the time we landed to create the Forum for Youth Investment, what was the, where, where were we in terms of the key ideas that we were trying to get across? What came, what's the through story that we brought with us? We, we used to talk a lot about the power of public ideas and, and Bob Reich's work on that of just what does it take to actually really work an idea and then find the opportunity to move it um, at different points in time. And I think it's interesting in that is that the, always in that work, it was the ideas that we were starting with, uh, the ideas of how learning happens, how learning and development happens, youth development sort of as the capture phrase for that, but taking everything we know about how um, young people learn and develop and having that be sort of the center and the starting point for the work. But then what does that mean as you're working across um, the uh, Crime Prevention Council that was across all the de departments at the federal level that had anything to do with young people, um, the work at the International Youth Foundation and the work that kind of grew out of that around youth and, and the, um, the community impact and youth action work that was with the, we had an international learning group on youth and community development that was getting a range of players across organizations in the US and also internationally, um, the international learning group that we ran there uh, to really explore what it means to have young people not just supported by these organizations but also really take action to transform their neighborhoods and communities. What does that look like? Uh, and how do you support that kind of agency? All of those um, ideas, you kind of had to back up and see them in a, in a big picture of, of what a young person's life is like and what does it take to, to really keep that whole picture in focus while you're doing that work. Um, I think one of the key things that runs through it is this idea that it, we, we often talk about thinking differently in, in the early days of, of some of the Ready by 21 work. Um, we talked about, and, may, and maybe Amy, if you pop this one up, we, we talked about thinking differently um, so that together we could act differently. We've kind of unpacked that one just a little bit more. We thought we talked more now about how to think and talk differently about these ideas and how you sort of see what it takes to really see and hear differently in terms of who you're engaging with and understanding and unpacking the data. Um, and then what it, what it takes to really kind of act and, and react differently as we're doing that. And then the punchline we say is like, and then being able to do it together. But I think the reason I just wanted to pop this back up here um, and folks have seen what it, what it um, have seen this in other conversations that we've had and what it takes to really coordinate and connect across that. But I think there's a togetherness at each step along the way there that in, if you think about the work we did 
whether it's with the President's Crime Prevention Council, the International Learning Group um, approaches, sometimes it's a council and structure, sometimes it's a learning group, but it really is about thinking together and being able to, and being able to um, shape those ideas together based on the different places that we sit coming into those conversations, different areas of expertise, the local wisdom um, that is, is really critical to those conversations and really sharpening those ideas together and then figuring out how you move those ideas into action and into impact. So there is a togetherness in, in all of this work. Um, if you were looking back over everything that on that wild roller coaster ride that we had before the forum, um, I think part of the landing of that roller coaster was uh, that to really shape some of to shape some of the work, um, we had an almost if we if they build it if we build it they will come um, kind of response. We tried things with key with the funders groups and key leaders and in government and other things. There was a through story to that moving around of how to really start with the power of these ideas and take them into action, and that's really what led to the creation of the forum. Is how can we do this with key partners? What what's it, what's it like to kind of set that table? um ourselves yeah i think that's absolutely right emphasize a couple of things that you said quickly because they really they really do explain um in some ways the sort of intentional but also opportunistic way that we move through these things mm -hmm. um, you mentioned this idea of sort of community youth development um, and we came in this space um with the rich ideas about youth development that were coming in from some of the Commonwealth countries like uh, you know, Great Britain and Ireland and, and Australia and South Africa, uh, where, where, where there really was this idea that youth development was about helping young people be socially ready to step in to their adult roles. It wasn't about schooling. It wasn't about remediation. It really was about helping young people explore and build confidence that they really could be active contributors to their community. And it had an implicit equity piece to it, that it was especially mm -hmm. important for us to do this with young people who were marginalized. So we were bringing those ideas into the US. We went internationally and sort of brought those ideas back with us into the US. And they took more in these two spaces. And you mentioned both. One was really in sort of helping people move from prevention and remediation into really thinking about how to make sure young people were prepared and were really ready to be full participants. So that mm -hmm. phrase, problem free isn't fully prepared, um, that uh, I'm known for, uh, really sort of came through that focus on how we got folks in child welfare and juvenile justice and second chance programs to really not just see that their job was to help young people, to fix young people and get them back up to sort of, you know, point zero, but to actually get them fully prepared, fully ready, fully engaged. The second thing was exactly as you said, this idea that, that, that there was an intersection between youth development and community development mm -hmm. that was very intentional. So as we go back in, and I think one of the things that I will do now that I have more time, as Ian has said, is to really go back and read the things that we wrote 20 and 30 years ago because we had such a focus on this question of how young people, we even had this thing we call the double arrow, yeah. you know, youth supporting communities and community supporting youth. How does it go together? How mm -hmm. is this really this yin yang? And it's so critical to young people's development and, and definition of identity uh, and agency that we really focus on that. Um, but as we were doing that power of ideas um, and moving to set up the Forum for Youth Investment, um, and putting a board together that was really a board that had some of these national folks as well as uh, uh, local folks who were coming from some of the communities we were working in around this idea of youth action and youth agency. Um, there was a phrase that, that both of us remember that the board said to us, uh, and they said, this is great. You've got these ideas moving. You've got the plate spinning. We love the work that you're doing, but it's now time to get focused, get grounded, and get results. Uh, and so while I may be the person who's known for the bumper sticker phrases and sort of getting these ideas pushed down into a couple of words so that people can remember them, that charge from the board is really the charge that you took, took on and said, all right, how do we get this work focused and grounded? How do we get it down so that we are meeting leaders where they are and giving them ways to really move these ideas to accelerate progress? So what, what was that shift? What made it happen? How did you make it happen? What did that look like in the early years of the forum as we were getting grounded and getting focused to get results? 
Uh, I, I remember the phrase, I remember the meeting, Peter Edelman is yes. the one who actually said it to us uh, and, and, and said that the, these ideas are all great, but they've got to really land with people in places who are trying to get real things to happen um, and, and, and be informed by them. And how, to, and how, does, what, how, does, how does that happen? Um, in the, it really began over the, probably the next a decade of different kinds of um, place-based learning groups, um, projects that really focused in on, that really were the, the working with the innovators in places um, that were doing this work. And, and again, having them um, inform the ide ideas as much as, as us be able to, to share them. It was looking at their work and trying to crystallize it. I'm thinking of, um, you mentioned the double arrows. I think another um, image that comes to mind is I think about the early days was the, the cube. Um, we had this, this cube that we used in the um, greater resources for after school programming project, right? So this was again going in on the, on the, in the community program space, um, really actually at the time when the, um, a lot of the, the 21st century schools funding was coming in and there was a, there was a concern again, echoes of the past in today of, oh, there's, about, there's a lot of money that's about to come into communities. How does it lift up the work that's already happening and not somehow pave over it? Uh, and so there was actually some funding that we, we got from um, one of the program officers, the Mott Foundation, to look at what are communities already doing in this space? How do we make sure that um, there are greater resources for after school programming, but they're also really understanding what, it what, what these emerging networks look like, what the concept, this is more at the center, but what the concept of intermediaries um, look like, what does it mean to have provider networks, how do you build kind of a um, infrastructure in the space and, and with some of the, the early roots for some of the quality work that came later. Um, but to do this, this is um, what the journey with you has been like. I, used to, I know you alliterate, we all know you alliterate, um, but we also um, draw a lot of pictures and this cube idea was really the beginnings of this, of this, um, this big picture thinking. What does it look like if you were trying to look at the life of a young person, which parents really look at the whole life of the young person, but if you're looking at the community level, how do you understand the whole experience from the time that children are little until they're big? So that was sort of zero to 21. We went to 21 to get it into the, to the next decade a little bit. What does that look like across morning until night, across all the, all the waking hours? and across the range of outcomes. So the problem free isn't fully prepared. We also said academics are important, but they're not enough. So how do you think about the academic and the vocational and, and the physical and emotional health um, and the social and civic engagement? What do all those things look like? If you took the age and the, um, and the, and the time of day and the outcomes, then you could start to see that it's, it was a patchwork quilt in terms of how you filled that in in communities that, that, um, that uh, that starting conversation of if we're really looking at all young people in our community, are they getting what they need? How that gets filled in looks very different for different young people, for different neighborhoods. Uh, and, it was, and it was really that conversation that came out of that that led into um, our, our um, sort of big picture Ready by 21 work. Yes. So you mentioned Ready by 21 and we didn't always have that. We've had taglines along the way when we started uh, the forum, I think our tagline was helping organizations that invest in youth, invest in change. And then we moved along to moving ideas to impact when our board mm -hmm. told us to get grounded and get focused and get results. Um, and then this idea that we had to actually talk to people about not just youth development, but give them an endpoint of ready by 21, ready for college, ready for work, ready for life. As, as you did this work in communities, why was it important to have that kind of a new focal point um, to continue to galvanize partnerships and galvanize planning? I think with the, the I think the other kind of similar idea in the, in the forum was the idea that it was a forum um, and that the, this idea of kind of allied youth fields or across these fields, and we've talked about this a little bit in the call, just all the different um, places and spaces where young people spend their time and how are you helping people look at uh, look at all of those places and spaces um, and in, in the lives of young people. And the Ready by 21 work really started with this idea of, um, and we talked about it on, on the, our last conversation together, how are you um, not just helping individual young people beat the odds, but how are you changing the odds for all of the children and youth uh, in your community? What does that look like um, to change the odds for all the children and youth in this country? Uh, and to do that, how do you really understand the landscape of 
the, the current community that you have. Community is perfectly designed to get the results you're currently seeing. So how do you understand the landscape of family, school, community supports? And then what are we gonna do about it as leaders? And so the Ready by 21 work was really going through that theory of change of how do you really help leaders work together more effectively in order to change that landscape and change the response uh, and, and be able to ultimately change the odds for children and youth. So we started working with leaders and when we think about leaders, it was leaders broadly defined in all levels of the work and in, in starting off in all places. And in our first Ready by 21 learning group, we had everything from a, a school superintendent in a, in a rural community in California to the governor's office, um, children's cabinet with the state of Maryland, um, to uh, an intermediary in, in Columbus, Indiana, uh, just a really a real range of leaders and, the, and what they came together around were we're trying to take this big picture approach. We're trying to move these ideas. We're trying to see what it would take in our community or our state to make sure that all young people are ready by 21. It's, it's, we move further along the age continuum now, but what does it take to really do that? And what could, with the power that we carry, what can we do? to be able to move that in our communities. I think one of the key things about the Ready by 21 work and ideas all along the way is that it's it, those boundary spanners that you mentioned can be found in many places and they often change jobs over time as well. Um, so how do, you, how do you support them in the work they're doing if they're the kind of leaders that can really galvanize others to work together? Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And you're, you're reminding me of a lot of history and the fact that that first Ready by 21 learning group really was a diverse group of boundary spanners who were sitting in rural school districts and United Ways and, uh, you know, and, and sitting inside of government, sitting inside of you know, youth development intermediaries. They really were leveraging from wherever they were sitting this idea of building this broader partnership table and having that table really stick together with this broader vision, um, as you described, that it can't just be about one outcome. It can't just be about one age group. And it really can't just be about one system or setting. We've got to have this set of, of shared goals. And we have to really figure out some way, which we didn't have then, of looking at and taking, pulling back and doing this. We used to talk about zooming in and zooming out, zooming out mm -hmm. to say, really, how well is this community doing? And I remember some of the power of these very simple tools. We were just asking people to, to use a coloring book, really. It was pretty much that simple. And color in these matrices, red, yellow, green. Do you think you're doing better for little kids or big kids? Do you think you're doing better in the academic space versus the social space versus the health space? And folks were finding this group exercise of comparing where they thought things were in their community quite quite valuable. Um, and so I think the early idea, uh, and you can talk a little bit more about this, that in order for these ideas to get sticky, we had to find simple creative ways for people to play with them. And so the tools, when we talked to Kim last week or a couple of weeks ago, uh, Kim Robinson from uh, the Weikert Center, uh, the, the other of the three uh, executive vice presidents, um, you know, the Weicker Center now has these incredibly sophisticated, you know, evaluated evidence-based, you know, continuous quality improvement tools. Um, you have really been finding tools to help people play with ideas. Uh, so they're not, they're not, you know, they don't need a validated tool to assess the quality of their program. They are really just trying to find ways to, to get on, literally get on the same page with their ideas. So Ready by 21 was one of those things that we had to put out there, just as a simple idea you can't stop at 18. Mm -hmm. because so many of the policies just stopped at 18. And when you were working with some of these groups, we had to find a way to push them. But anything else about the simple tools that you put together early on, and I know we'll get into some more sophisticated ones, that really help people get around a table and play to see how their thinking was influencing their decision making. Yeah, I'm I, I thinking about that because it, it did, there were simple conversation starters in a way and ways, ways that people brought their own, um, in, in some ways, their perception data of, of what was happening in their communities as a starting point for those conversations. And we'd help them do that. It did get into more detailed, like how do you do outcomes focused strategic planning and and in community wide processes that really focus on community engagement. Um, it's, it's sort of where it, it evolved to. But I think about that zoom out, zoom in. 
that you were talking about and, and we would do these and so we'd, we'd map in how well do you think your young people are doing how well where do you think the resources and attention are going sometimes there would be um, actual surveys and things behind it sometimes it was the in the room kind of build the picture um, but it would just take um, age group by those different outcome areas and have people map it out and then we'd have this classic moment um, it maybe it's just how strategic planning happened or used to happen. This classic moment where folks would say, okay, now we've looked at this whole picture and we've scanned everything. We've looked at our data and like that. And what now what we need to do is like pick something, right? So we see, we see that, you know, red lights going off here and over here, we're not doing well in some of these areas. So we just need to pick one or maybe even maybe like pick three, right? We're just going to zoom in and pick something. And then we'd, we'd hear time and again from folks that we did that. And then something else came up on the radar screen. Maybe it was um, childhood obesity. Maybe it was um, something that was happening around uh, grade level reading that we were off of. Something, something else came up because we were, we were all looking over here. And, and then we have to go like do the whole scan again. And so our encouragement to folks in terms of the big picture approach was as you're picking some, as you're saying you have to pick three, let at least one of those things be zooming out and having some way to keep the overall radar screen in focus so that as things change and they change rapidly we've all been through this past year but you think about the community level things just change over time the idea is to be able to see the change as it's happening and be able to with all the relationships we've, you've built respond to that changing reality um, for the, the young people in in your community and have them involved in bringing about that change as well so I think that's that's the kind of thing that in, in some ways we 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 still use. It's a it's a simple thought and we can use it in, in different levels of complexity, but those dashboards for youth that uh, were, were the starting tool became really core to the strategic planning work of, of how do you keep a big picture in focus while you're actually still zooming in on some parts to really get some traction and make a difference. So as we move forward into the present, um, and definitely if folks have questions about history or we will get to the, we'll get to the current in just a minute. Um, but I think uh, for the record, since I'm the person who's helping us get the record straight, um, uh, it's important to know whether these ideas have been around for a long time and that, the, and that the strategies for getting people to think about these ideas have been around for a long time because we really are coming back full circle into a space in which we've got more science and more evidence and more willingness to play with these ideas that we're back in the idea, we're back in the idea promotion space. Um, and then pushing again forward to say, okay, as people are really getting these ideas, how do we basically help them bring, bring them into key places of influence so they can get to impact and your tools have moved along the way. So let's fast forward up from the early Ready by 21 working group or learning group, which I know sort of brought that diverse set of folks together. And it gave us an opportunity to see how people in different settings um, uh, in different systems uh, were using these ideas and moving them. That let us come back to say, okay, we think we have enough of these intermediaries, these out of school time youth development intermediaries, that it's time to really push these ideas about quality um, mm -hmm. up to the city level. Um, and so we started Quality Counts. And with Quality Counts came the partnership with High Scope Educational Research Foundation, which then became the Weicker Center. So those who joined us last time, that commitment um, to really come in and help communities think not just about how to build these program networks, but how to move the idea of quality as a key part of what a community needs to be committed to. So yes, we need quantity, but we also need quality. And that's what was happening in that space. But as we saw that happen, this bigger space became sort of the Ready by 21 National Partnership. As communities were ready to put children's cabinets, coordinating bodies, they were ready to sort of set these tables for this cross-sector, cross-system planning. You saw enough similarities in what people were doing and enough similarities in who was sitting at the table, even though different people may be convening the table, different groups might be convening the table, that it felt like it was time to go have conversations with some of the national organizations and get them to figure out with us how to take this to scale. So take us forward quickly into the Ready by 21 National Partnership and how that sort of intersected, that work intersected with collective impact. Sure. Because it came along in that same time. 
Yeah, it did. And and it's and it's the and the Ready by 21 idea is kind of going through all these initiatives. We had the Ready by 21, um, as you mentioned, Quality Counts, and then Ready by 21 South East Challenge, which we which we put together with a, a combination of um, of really sort of idea and and um, membership partners, United Way, School ASA, School Administrators Association at that time, Corporate Voices for Working Families. We tried to think through like those national partners that were connecting with people locally that were the people that were most often asked to be around these tables. And we're still hearing this, you know, we're hearing the same things then that we're hearing now. It's it is the um, how do you how do you get things kind of organized in your own space to be able to bring it to the table and connect with other partners to be able to, to make that. They, these connections happen and have definitely been hearing from um, places this year that it's the same, it's some of the same kinds of challenges. The, um, the work there really did focus a lot on how do you get the, the relationship sort of more structured for being able to manage change over time. Um, one of those key um, and uh, components of the, of the planning and partnership work that you talked about at the, at the top of the hour. Um, how, do you, how do you work with the range of leaders, but how do you actually um, structure and think about the planning and work that they can do together? So it did, it, did, it sort of ended up, while we had been working on this for, um, for a while, uh, it sort of coincided with, and we ended up kind of writing the collective impact wave uh, in terms of that and, and looking, and a lot of the collective impact was, was started with a, um, a cradle to career, but a, a K-12 focus. And so many places, again, it was the, as this wave is coming through, how are we really helping to support the, the range of places, spaces, systems, settings in a community to be a part of that conversation, to be seen in that conversation, uh, and, and really support in many places coming to more of a, a, a different ways they call it, but a youth master planning um, kind of approach. I see Maggie on the, on, the, on the call here from New Orleans and the work that they just did this last year um, uh, there around, this kind of how do you get the, the range of players in the community um, to the table and overall game plan? Although I'd say there in New Orleans, um, what you all have done is had more of a, as much of a master youth engagement process with young people helping to lead the work as, as a youth master planning process. It's sort of a both and. Um, but bringing this up through the, the collective impact space, I think that the lessons that we learned along the way is um, what we'd hear from places. It's, it's, it's much about building the relationships and the ways of working together as it is the structures and sort of some of the lessons learned is sometimes the structures could become too top heavy and, and become more about their um, operation themselves and to kind of guard against that. But at the same time, realizing that having somebody like having the backbone to help make these efforts move forward is also critically important. So the leaders in the effort are not just sitting around a kitchen table at 10 o'clock at night trying to figure out how all the pieces fit together. Uh, so it, it was really trying to think about how um, how to to be more nimble over time? I think is what these things that, that a lot of the places that have had these partnerships, the shift has been a little bit from just the, the longer range planning, and certainly in this last year, is how the relationships that we've built by being around the same tables, being in the same rooms, being on the same screens, helped us to respond to the fact that our communities change, the lives of our young people change. And if we're here, it's not about a five-year plan. It's about how are we how are we responding and improving and learning with each other um, as things emerge and, and evolve and change. So that that message um, that I think sort of jarred a lot of us from that first uh, FSG article about collective impact, which was basically the message of we went out to look for partnerships to see if they had an impact, and we couldn't find very many. So we see a lot of plans sitting on shelves, but we don't really see a lot of partnerships that have been able to sort of push these ideas through to really implement at scale to get to impact. Um, and I think that lesson is one that you really sort of brought in to say, how do we do that? How do we not just- What are, what are the nuts and bolts? We, we, we have do these institutes bolts? for years with the United Way about the nuts and bolts of collective impact. How do you really train to that? There are, there are specific, um, it takes big picture thinking, but there are specific skills that you can develop and support along the way um, and so really did those trainings around that. Um, I think the other piece around it is it's back to changing the odds. It's why we, it, it is the, it's what we used to talk about as the denominator problem. And that if you just go in and you say, what they often would have this experience with the, um, with some of the opportunity youth coalitions. If we're going in and just adding up uh, as, as well as others, if we're adding up everything, all the young people that we get to in terms of who our providers are reaching right now, 
invariably um, it would be 15 to 20% of the actual numbers in that community that, that were sort of the target population. Uh, and that really flipped the conversation for folks. If you're, if you're just adding up, if your numerator is just who you're reaching already, you're not at all getting to the challenge of all the young people that are facing these challenges in our community. So how do you flip that? And I think that's, those are the, the lessons from that, that work carry forward. Um, and, they're, and again, they're things that we're seeing today. People are trying to say, not just who do we already get to, but who in our communities have disconnected, who needs, who, how do we re-engage? Um, what can we do to kind of learn together about how to do that work more effectively? Good. So we've got about 20 minutes left and I wanna bring us up into the, into the recent present uh, and, and talk a little bit about where this work is going next. But one thing began to happen um, and we saw it begin to happen about five years ago, but then we had an opportunity to really step into it on both sides. Um, and that was this idea of sort of moving, whether you call it social emotional learning or 21st century skills or life skills. The fact that our K-12 partners really started to lean in to this conversation um, and not just think of SEL as sort of another set of skills that young people need to build that we need to have a curriculum for and how do we squeeze another curriculum in to the work that's already going on, but this broader idea of how skills and competencies really integrate and build as we got a deeper understanding of how learning happens, not just in little kids, but in young people, in adolescents. That work that then sort of went to the, the we had the Seed Commission, we now have the Souls Alliance, the Science of Learning and Development, and the fact that the forum got invited to be at those tables, and the fact that we had uh, critical organizations and foundations like uh, the Wallace Foundation and like uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the Bechtel uh, Junior Foundation, uh, really bringing together partners like Altria, bringing partners together who were in this space to really have this conversation about how do we leverage this interest in not just saying we're going to broaden the list of outcomes for young people, but we're actually going to come back and take a look at this idea that what you see young people being able to do is really, as you said before, very much determined by how you create the environment and the experiences mm -hmm. and the relationships. So as we saw that pendulum swing back, uh, we heard uh, when we talked to Kim about how SEL came in and really allowed us to sort of both demonstrate the power of improving program quality, but also really sharpen the lenses that we use to say, is this, are these programs doing everything that we can for young people? But we also really got this real big glimpse into what it meant to really partner with schools. And again, we had had our social services partners at the table, we had had our community development partners at the table, but if we're gonna be honest, we really never had at the national or the local level, very few times was this work really being led <laughs> and envisioned by our school partners. So something got in the water about five years ago that really sort of came back to that idea of school community partnerships, but really school community partnerships to do what we would say is now sort of creating this and understanding this ecosystem in which learning and development happens. And so here we are now with this thing that we've called, that we're calling the readiness projects, um, which really came out of the fact that we had an opportunity to sit with K-12 people to sit with youth development people who were being, yes, we wanna be more intentional. We think we've always been doing it. We've been measuring program quality, but now we're gonna go the extra mile to really explain to you what it is that we do and what it is that we do differently to get to these outcomes. So we have this thing called the readiness projects that we're doing now with the National Urban League and we're doing with our partners at AAR, the American Institute for Research, and you're managing it and I'm stepping out of the way and the whole thing is yours. And it's a big thing. It's me and it's a team. It's bigger. <laughs> you and the it's, team. It's, it's, me and the uh, team. I'm happy to be a part of the and, team. And I am, and you're still a part of the team. Um, and our colleagues and our colleagues in the forum are a part of the team. And the team they, has colleagues from all kinds of partners, but still it's back at that space of, we have a chance to reset the ideas. We have a chance to really get people to think differently not just because we know the science of how, how learning happens in the brain, but we understand this idea of ecosystem. So where are you going, Rita? Yes, Arthur says- No, no pressure. Question. Thank you, Arthur. No pressure, Rita. Um, not where, at all. No, I just wanted to- Why, and why this, what is this opportunity? And this is, this is 
what I was reflecting on is that, you know, I starting off as a, as an eighth grade teacher and a youth worker and thinking about all these, like doing good teaching and good youth work. These are the same things. How do we think about it? Um, starting with that whole focus on school community partnerships. I think you're right. I, I think it's the same ideas. More research to, to underpin it. It's the same ideas, but there is an, there is a connection and openness in the audience for those ideas if, that, that we have not really seen before these in, the, in this way before these last few years. And I think it is that idea, like being able to have people think social learning is social and emotional. What does that look like? Being able in the in in our dear friends in this in the um in the science of learning development alliance, I remember the very first meeting I went to and having a little um confab in the hallway in, at the break talking about if I said if I said to you that there was a group of people in your community that had already been starting with everything we know about how young people learn and develop as the starting point for their work, and have been saying that environments matter and saying that learning happens through relationships and had, they had been starting and that this was their starting point. Not that it's something new to them, but it's really their starting point in, the, in, the, in how learning happens. Wouldn't you want them at the table with you at the community level, at the national level, talking about what they've learned about how to make engaging learning environments? What would that look like? And, and just What's exciting about the conversation is everybody is there, under, having them still see each other as, as, as um, folks with expertise and lived experience in how to make this happen, I think it's the conversation and the challenge and, and, the, and the kind of mutual understanding and respect, I think, as we come into this space together is that, is that at the same time, people have been challenging more and more the systems as they currently exist were just created in a way that was not for all to succeed. The systems, whether it's education or juvenile justice, child welfare, it's whether young, the young people that have been pushed out or pulled into systems and kind of systematized in that way. In the same time period, the conversations have been, it's not just about systems reform. We have to completely reimagine what this looks like. So coming into the present day, what it, make, what it means to have equitable ecosystems for young people, what it means for the range of players to be thinking about this differently. This is, this is the space and the time that we're in. And, we're, and, and it's just been completely um, ramped up by what this last year has been. Uh, so that, that is, we can talk more about the readiness projects and the space that we're creating for that work to happen. But I think that the ideas, while they're in some ways the roots of the ideas, it's also getting much more explicit. We used to talk about all young people being ready for college, work, and life. What does it mean for each and every young person to get the supports they need to be ready, to get the supports they need to engage in the different places that they spend their time? It, it's just a different conversation uh, than when we, um, it's a more explicit conversation about what has been put in place uh, in our country and in our communities that really are have the, have the racism built in and it is really saying how do we tackle this unpack them reimagine and put things back together in a different way so i'm going to pick up on that word explicit and ian i'm going to ask if you can to sort of go to that slide that has those wonderful red doors to the school um, and, and 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 we can start there for a minute um, as we get get toward the end but this opportunity to be explicit is so important because what we've seen over the past uh, several years is the fact that the language is getting into the vision statements. So we're getting it there. We're getting equity. We're getting whole child. We're getting whole community. We're getting, we're getting community partners. We're getting things written in. Um, let's go back to the, uh, or I guess it must have just self-timed itself. Um, uh, but, uh, one of the things that we've been talking about and is getting is drilling down to be explicit about talking about all learning, how it happens in all settings with all adults. Uh, and so when those school doors closed, that disruption that happened with school gave us a huge opportunity that obviously no one wanted, and we certainly hadn't anticipated. Um, and that was to actually say, well, yes, the school doors closed, but if we're now gonna to try to figure out where learning can happen when those school doors close, we need to really understand what those settings are inside the building. And maybe if it works in, we'll go to the little picture behind. Uh, and those settings 
inside of a school are more than classrooms. Um, you know, it's the library, it's the cafeteria, it's the sports field, it's the hallways, it's the playgrounds, it's all of those things. And so you can you can keep going in. It's it's not going to cooperate with us. Um, so you can go on there. So I think to the word that you said about explicit, we really have been with the readiness projects, and I want you to just sort of talk us through where you're going next with this. Um, we really have had this opportunity to grab the disruption and grab the fact that the systems that we refer to as after school or out of school or summer have really been able to step up and demonstrate the power that they have to be these flexible delivery systems for learning and development who were much more nimble in their ability to step in and recreate some of those settings where learning happens um, and recreate it through the lens of relationships, which is how they often come in to work with young people because they work with them voluntarily. So this idea of, yes, we all wanna build back better and we all want to make sure our schools are built back better and we all say we're not going back to normal but what does it mean to actually take full advantage of the opportunities that we have to build forward together so take the last couple of minutes Rita to sort of talk through in whatever way you want where we are in sort of activating these goals and strategies that over the past six to eight months have sort of galvanized under this build forward together umbrella Sure, and I think being able to speak to that, it's, it's work that's happening that we're hearing both at the local level and in the national conversations. And I've been looking more recently at, the, at how to be able to support the, the um, as the national turns to focus on state uh, with the funds that are coming into communities now. Um, but just looking at this, um, this came out of the conversations that we've been doing as a part of the readiness projects over the last six months with um, national and local leaders saying, what are we grappling with right now? What are the real issues that we're facing? And we know we need to build schools back better in a, in a, in a in reimagined in different ways and take lessons learned from the past year and also really um, accelerate um, the, the supports that we have for, for young people now. We need to strengthen and leverage those community partners. Increasingly, there's a adolescents are getting um, a short shrift in all of this. And so how are we making sure that they are um, centered uh, in, in the work and, and uh, in the, the thinking about what, um, what that work should be, the conversations as well as the action. Um, and then how are we really innovating using summers and, and to really innovate towards long-term change. I'm gonna to speak to that one for just a moment because we've had at the national level, this group that started really um, just coming into more of an eco, a learning and development ecosystem space, many of the readiness projects, co-strategists and some others that came together around this uh, this idea of even this summer, how are we uh, leveraging this summer as a springboard to thinking about the, the following year differently? Um, and how are we seeing each other more in the national partnership space, as well as how are we supporting this work that's happening locally? So we're, we're seeing this happen at multiple levels, I think, in terms of the work and what is both exciting, daunting, um, it, it's not, it's, it's energizing, uh, but also, um, I'm not gonna say it's exhausting, it's just all consuming, is that, is that we're all figuring it out together. If to me, it feels like the early days of the, the Ready by 21 work. We're trying to think about and sharpen what are those ideas to actually help people think about real time, what is the work that they're, how are they doing things differently in terms of their work? Um, how are we flipping the, the you know, whether we can or not, the, the, the kind of language around lot, learning loss or the lost year, to what were the, the assets that were developed during this year? What have we learned that we can carry forward into the space? How are we really seeing uh, the young people that have not been showing up for the, the opportunities that have been put out there? Who's connecting with them and how are we making those, um, how, how are we understanding what that picture looks like? And this in this conversation, it is so much more than you and me and even the, even the powerful team that we have at the forum. It really is the work that we're doing with our partners uh, and their partners to try to create this collective learning space. And we have to learn very quickly because these really are, um, these really are extraordinary times that we're in. And, we're, and we're, we have to have that learning bu bubble up from the local work to really inform state and national um, where we should be focused in these efforts. Um, so, on the readiness projects, this is, this is uh, I know Catherine put the thing in the link and, and many of you are here because you're connected to this work already. So I won't go into it in great detail, but I think success for that work um, is really, really as we're hearing from, um, from folks across the country at national level and at the local level, it's the, how do we use this opportunity 
to not just go all out and then hit to, to some kind of you know cliff three years out in terms of funding and attention and, and know-how. How are we actually really building the, the way of doing business and the infrastructure nationally, state and local for realizing the potential of our young people and, and our communities? What does it take to do that? If there were ever an opportunity with the softening of the walls between K-12, after school, out of school time, summer learning, uh, youth workforce development, uh, community service, et cetera, even the different funding streams that are coming in, if there's a different way of doing business, this is the time to really figure that out. Absolutely. So as we, as we come to the end, and I know there's so many things we can talk about in this space, we just will pause. Um, uh, and, and, and for those folks who don't know about uh, the Readiness Projects and Build Forward Together, please go, uh, go start uh, taking a look um, because we're really on the cusp, I think, of uh, being able to uh, not just work with these ideas, but really identify, as Rita said, what are, the, what are the really specific tools and ways that we help people move these ideas to impact? How do we really get them to think and talk differently, see and hear differently, act and react differently in their own spaces so that when they come together to partner, they are partnering with the kind of understanding and respect needed to make these partnerships stick and not just be partnering around a project or partnering around transactional things like who shares buses and who shares space, but really have these strategic partnerships that will allow us to have young people have healthy, equitable ecosystems for learning and development. How do we get to the idea of sort of learning centered, learner centered? Um, There's so many partners in this space now with us. Uh, you can also see the list of those, the broad list of partners um, on the website as well. Um, but Marita, you've talked about the success as really sort of helping us sort of get from, sort of leverage this disruption um, so that three years from now it doesn't go away. And I think that really is the perfect way to think about it. Um, I want to sort of uh, end by just emphasizing that in that little chart that you just had up, it said leverage summers, <laughs> not mm -hmm. just leverage summer. And I think the, the work that you and the partners have been doing um, to really sort of walk the balance. And I see some of the folks on the screen on, on the participant list, like Arthur Pearson from, from Outward Bound and Thompson Island, the, to walk this balance between, yes, we have to do things differently this summer. We have a huge opportunity to get this things right. But if we just see this as a temporary, we have to do it this summer because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And then we go back to the way it was before, we will lose a huge opportunity. Um, and we certainly will lose a huge opportunity if we don't keep going forward. So, uh, and focus on adolescence. And that was one of the things in your, in your theme. I'm gonna hand it back to Ian, um, but on that last piece of adolescence, um, while I think with the readiness projects and build forward together, we've sort of focused on how we get that learning and development ecosystem sort of moving forward, the forum really has back to its roots this commitment to working with employment and child welfare and juvenile justice and this huge commitment to making sure that young people themselves are active active parts of uh, the solution. Uh, and so when we come back next week and I think Ian just dropped it in the chat uh, or the next time Ian will tell you the date, uh, we'll have Thad join us. Um, uh, and Thaddeus is really uh, sort of as we divided up the labor as this thing got bigger, um, is really the one who's been leading our work around opportunity youth, as well as led the historic work at the policy level around creating children's cabinets. So Ian, I'm going to hand it back to you for the last word. Marita, we could stay on the screen for another hour, but I'll probably just see you for coffee. Uh, so thank you for doing this with me. And Ian, back to you. So thank you very much for the excellent conversation today. Um, definitely stay in touch with us. Here's information about our website as well as our social media handles. As Karen mentioned, we have part three of the conversation scheduled for next week with Thaddeus Ferber, executive vice president and head of the unit focused on policy and strategic storytelling. And then on May 19th to 20th, we hope you will all be able to join us for the eighth annual Ready by 21 national meeting, which will be held virtually. So please join us and thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much to Maureen and Karen.